Thank you so much, uh, Matt, and the whole of the Twinkle TA uh, fabulous team for inviting me uh, tonight to lead the latest in your monthly uh, CPD sessions. I could not be more excited and feel more honoured and privileged to be uh, spending an hour or so with yourselves. Um, and uh, I really, really look forward to um, just having lots and lots of time together, not just today, but as I was just saying to Matt, hopefully uh, in, in many, many more further sessions so we can explore lots of really exciting initiatives um, that have uh, arisen from a, the last 20, 25 years or so um, in, in education. Um, so just to, just to put it all into context of, of where I've come to be today, um, I started life off as a research scientist um, and did lots of uh, sort of did a PhD in science and biochemistry and did lots of uh, work um, as a research scientist first. And then at, at about, uh, I think I was about 30, I turned, um, I did a PGC and completely changed track and careers and became a primary school teacher uh, in Bristol. And um, I loved every single minute uh, since that change. And then, then I then moved to um, Brighton, where I live now. And a, I used to move to Brighton to move into senior leadership and <clears throat> became a deputy head um, uh, of, of a school here. And until recently, um, then became the head teacher of um, a couple of um, primary schools uh, here in Brighton. Um, just prior to the pandemic, I took the time to um, step away from headship and write the book, which is a collection of all the amazing things that I have ever seen make a real difference to children and to staff uh, in my whole time. So it's a compendium of, of everything that I believe that I have seen work so, so well. Um, and it's so wonderful for it all now to be um, within uh, within one place and as part of uh, as part of the book. And um, the last three, this is my third year, last three years I've now sort of com come back full circle and I'm now a lecturer at the University of Sussex on the teacher training course. So I feel now that I, um, it's, it's an amazing, <clears throat> Uh, circle to, to join to be now uh, inspiring the next generation um, of teachers and educators and um, uh, and be also working very closely with schools all around the country on the joy of not knowing um, approach. Um, so working with um, a whole range of um, educators nationally and um, in lots of places internationally too. So um, that's my kind of little history of where, where I've got to now. But within all that, what I wanted to say is that I have the most utmost respect and I'm in awe of the job that you all do. I have, I, it's, it's amazing that you're all here tonight uh, at 7.15, uh, 7.30 on, on your first day back on a Monday evening. It's an amazing the dedication that you all show um on a day-to-day -day basis and hopefully we'll we'll have other sessions together but just just to let you know the importance that i have always placed on support staff on uh, all, all 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 range of, of support staff is that they um they became uh, when i was a head teacher um, i formulated a process called um multi-professional teams which um which which worked by getting every single member of staff, including the, the cleaners, midday supervisors, every member of staff, clerical, um, on the first inset day, every member of staff then chose a, a team to join for the whole year. And each of each one of those multi-professional teams uh, would then drive one of the school development priorities forward for the whole year. And I just can't tell you how special that was because what I believe, I have always believed and still believe, is that every, sing, every single person in a school is an expert in what they do. 
And I've always said to all my support staff, you're much more of an expert in what you do than I am um, as, as a head teacher. So that was using those more professional teams was, was a really amazing way of getting all the ideas from the people who, are, who actually have the expert knowledge and, um, and are doing the, the, the actual jobs and have all the ideas uh, to put forward and to, to make sure that the school um, moves uh, forward and strategically um, by, um, by having the combined ideas of everyone. So uh, you are the most important people, I believe, in, in school. And as I say in my, um, in my first slide that I'll show you, you are the heart uh, of the school strategic um, uh, development. And also you're at the heart of children's uh, learning. So it just, I just could not um, be more pleased to be able to share all these ideas with you. Let me just start by sharing the screen. During the presentation, I'll, um, we'll try and have um, a couple of uh, stops along the way so we can all come back together and, and discuss anything at all that comes to mind. Um, as, as Emma's already put in the chat, I have also created a really useful Padlet for us because I don't want this to be uh, a one-off scenario. I want this to be a very, very long-term um, kind of partnership and relationship between us. Um, and what the Padlet does is allow us to keep adding things, to keep putting things on, to keep discussing things, anything at all. I've also added a column on there um, for you to add any thoughts, any questions, any queries, and then I'll just keep looking at the Padlet and we can use it as a uh, as a means of, of keeping our communication uh, going. There are also lots of really interesting articles in there and also lots of links to resources that um, MSM, that, uh, that Tenkor uh, provides. So let me just start by sharing um, a, uh, the presentation with you and going through the various aspects of all the ideas that I want to share with you um, today. So <clears throat> the idea of today is to share with you all the things that I have seen put in practice, seen others put in practice. You know, these are real, real hands-on experiences that I have um, seen transform the lives of children. And the way they transform the lives of children is because they make children feel really good about themselves. So um, the, the majority of what constitutes the, um, um, the, the joy of not knowing um, philosophy of education and of school leadership, the majority of it is based on how on, on building children's self-esteem, on, 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 on ensuring that children feel um, really, really good about themselves and in feeling really good about themselves um, they are then able to learn. So the precursor to learning, I believe, is how you feel. And you can see that this is um, highlighted um, on our first slide. And I really wanted to share this with you because this is uh, a slide that I create, uh, a diagram uh, that I created to demonstrate how the whole school functions. Um, and what I have at the center of these are yourselves. So you are at the heart of this wheel, you're, you're the, the people that make this wheel go round, and you do that because you are in a unique position that that has so much closeness and so much expertise and so much to offer within that triangular relationship of the child, school, and family. And what's really interesting about this is that um, <clears throat> I wanted. To, to share with you today that um, in order for learning to, to happen, I believe that lots of conditions need to be met first. Um, and a lot of those conditions uh, I have found or I'm yeah, really passionate about are to do with establishing a values-based approach to how we are. So setting uh, whole school values in place that define how everyone is, and when you work, uh, when you work with your students, I feel that this is so critical in having this common understanding that when you and them are together, um, you are all working 
through a, a common set of values. And I'm sure lots of your schools will have it, but uh, will have a kind of a set of values uh, already in place. But it's what you'll see through the, the, the whole approach is that what I um, what I have found that is, is really effective is the explicit sharing of this uh, with the children at all times. And, and also the, the way that these are um, that these are obtained by schools is through a democratic process where everybody votes, all the children, all the staff, all the families, all the local communities. So it's, it's done through a democratic uh, process to get those words in the first place, and then those are com commonly understood. So when you are with your students, and I, it, it's just fascinating because. Having joined your uh, Facebook uh, TA group, I've been really enjoying reading some of your posts and quite a few of them, um, especially the, the ones this weekend, point to the fact that you are not seeing in some of the classes these factors um, uh, as being of, of paramount in, in how children are. And if you imagine that if those aren't there, you can see that's that's the first step. Of, of the wheel, that's the first process. So if that's not in place, then it's very difficult for any learning to happen. <clears throat> but when we have um, a values-based approach to education and to being together, what's really exciting to share with the children is that what that allows to happen is that their rights are met. Um, I don't know if you've come across the United Nations Children's Rights Charter, the UNCRC Charter, but it's such a fascinating um, concept to share with the children that by law, every child in the world has got um, those 78 or so um, uh, rights that, uh, that, that they all have, their, their, you know, they all absolutely have their, those rights through the charter. Um, and as a school, and this is something that you can, if you haven't got in your school and you want to achieve yourself with with the children you work with you can you can show them the whole chart and you can choose the ones that they value the most so for example uh, the right to an education the right to be safe the right to be listened to to relax and play to be treated fairly you know these are amazing things but what's really fascinating is that <clears throat> children start to realize that they they can't have their rights met unless these values um, are first of all in place. So it, it gives, it starts to place a known of responsibility on themselves to, to be in a certain way so that their rights and the rights of all their friends are met. And then what's really interesting is that once their rights are met, then the learning can happen. And through the all the ideas I will share with you and through very much the, the basis of the, the junk approach, the learning is presented in a way, and the group is presented in a way that encourages the children to not just learn the content or the knowledge, but to become effective as lifelong learners. So um, what's really exciting is to think of the children that you work with and to say, do they have these attributes? Do they have this? Um, are they curious? Are they able to work collaboratively? Are they able to think creatively? Are they resourceful? Do they know what strategies to use? Can they reflect um, on their learning and how things are going? And are they resilient? Do they do they just give up when things become difficult, or are they ones that 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 embrace difficulty and keep going even when things are really hard? So this is what's known as the lifelong learning dispositions and. Uh, what's really exciting is that um, I worked sort of nationally when these were first introduced with the University of Bristol, and we developed the idea of linking them to an animal. So I don't know if any of your schools do these sort of things and have these sort of ideas, uh, but linking them to an animal uh, is so incredibly powerful. Um, so, for example, um, I don't know if you if you can see it here, but um, I'll show you later the. Um, the, these are uh, the animals are actually in the classroom, and the children you know, grab them and, and 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 just have them with them. So they say, you know, I'm you know I'm being really resilient like the tortoise, and it just makes a huge difference in terms of um, how they can see what those attributes um, um, are, are, are pointing to, because they can see that that's what the animals uh, portray. 
Uh, that's a really fascinating project um, process to go through and project to maybe introduce into your schools um, if you already don't um, don't have them. And then what what's really fascinating for us all to think about today is the purpose of education. So when this has been the conditions have been set in place and the learning has happened, the purpose of education, I'm sure you have these conversations with all your children and students is that they are then able to contribute to society and to all the communities they that belong to. Um, so that is the whole purpose. So all the time, this is why I think you are so much at the heart of this triangular relationship, because you are all the time um, being at the heart of how those children feel and act and can contribute to when they are by themselves, when they are with, <clears throat> with their families, when they're at school, when they're outside the local community and how they feel as part of the national and very much now the global community. So this is a really, really lovely way that encompasses kind of the whole ethos um, of, of what schools are for, what education is for, and very much what your role um, in, in the children's lives is, is like. Um, and that takes us to um, something I, I wanted to share with you in terms of the actual teaching and learning process. And everything I share with you today, I think if you're thinking this is really interesting, just try and think um, of, of having these conversations and these chats with your children at, at, in this exactly the same way. They is the most fascinating thing you can do. Um, is to share this kind of language of learning and purpose of learning and purpose of teaching and, and purpose of being in school and purpose of education. All that, I think, makes such a difference in terms of how children feel um, on, a, on a normal basis and also how they feel when they come and work with yourselves because you, you, you'll you see today all the ideas that I'll share with you then make children feel really special um, when they come uh, and work with yourself. So, Einstein said something really, really interesting, and I wonder what you think about this. He said, I never teach my students. I just provide the conditions in which they can learn. And I find that a really kind of quite provocative, but quite fascinating um, uh, kind of um, quote. And it's one that opens the book and I just love so much because it just, every time I read it, it makes me think of something else. It's just such a, a, a fantastic, way of looking at the process of teaching and, and what I think it, it does is it it moves us away from that traditional perception of teaching to be the teacher or the teaching assistant or the support member of staff having all the knowledge that they impart on others. It moves away from that and it moves towards what I find really fascinating is that you are co you you rather than imparting the knowledge you you're co-creating the conditions in which knowledge uh, can evolve and develop. Um, and it's just really interesting tonight to share this with you. It's quite emotional because I think that you are the people that provide the conditions in which children can learn. You know, it's it's if you think about your role, that's you, isn't it? You are providing the conditions in which they can learn. Um, and you do that with so much expertise at, at all times. So this is, you know, this is absolutely you. But I wanted to take it a little bit further and, and add a little bit more of Marcelo to Einstein. <laughs> um, because the role of the TA and the support members, that by I mean all of you, all, all, uh, all of you in, in your support roles, um, uh, are such key to the teaching and learning process that I wanted to share this ad added um, sort of concept that I don't, even though I love that quote so much, I don't think it's enough. You know, I don't think it's enough to provide the conditions in which children can learn. And the reason why I don't think it's enough, and I'd love to, to hear what you what you think, is because you can provide the conditions in which children can learn, and I'm sure you all know, Although you're providing the conditions, a lot of children will still not engage with their learning. So that's what makes that's what made me that's what makes a whole of the Joe of Not Know approach so exciting because it, it moves 
it moves the educator from providing just providing the conditions in which children can learn to to providing the conditions in which children will want to learn that's the main message today um they there's no point in providing the conditions in which they can learn unless you also provide the conditions which will make them want to learn and in that sense if we think about what will make them want to learn and i'm sure you, you know, with you have so much experience in terms of the very the various things that children uh, see see them see as barriers to their learning that in order for them to want to learn they have to overcome all those barriers and i feel that um they will have no barriers if they feel equipped with everything they need to be able to succeed yeah that's the key isn't it that everything they need to be able to succeed so if they come to you or when you work with them if they feel yes i know that when i work with my support member of staff i have all the i i'm given i'm equipped with everything i need to be able to succeed and very much so from an emotional point of view i'm sure your experts are getting that um that right from a social you know how you work with each other how you work uh, make sure and work in teams in groups cognitively how you offer them the opportunity to to think clearly through um through what they do and give them a little bit more time than in whole class scenarios academically and culturally um and you'll see that um the cultural and the linguistic aspect of um of a child's richness is very much for the part of the joy of not knowing approach and the last chapter is called multilingual thinking in multicultural classrooms because i believe if that if you tap into a child's own culture own heritage own language and allow them to express themselves through that rather than just through a language of instruction you will transform ch children immediately is how they will feel so differently and um i'm really arguing for that to become part of the process that the curriculum is um is driven through that that actually all schools allow children to access the learning in whichever language they choose again a really provocative um question for yourselves i'd love to to think um to to see what what you think about that but it it uh, is makes such a difference um and then the other thing that i wanted to add to this quote is that um if we think about when learning is at its best another little provocation that i want to offer you is that i think is that it's best when children don't realize that they're learning <laughs> which is really funny isn't it because um if you imagine uh, and i'm sure you there's lots of you here who are working with the eyfs which is my absolute passion if you imagine how children learn in the eyfs which you know we all know is when learning is at its best they are learning but they not realizing that they're learning it's only when we go further up the school that we really make them conscious of what they're learning and i feel that sometimes by itself in itself creates lots of barriers so i've developed this thing called dismetacognition which is the opposite of metacognition to describe those times when we present the learning to children and and they don't realize that they're actually learning but they are but they are achieving the the learning objectives that you want them to achieve so through open ended investigations through using de bono's hats through drama through you know all those ways of presenting the learning through philosophical questions through creative thinking you know all those ways of uh, that I'll share lots of examples with you today are making the children think differently and are not they're not really conscious that the of what they're having to learn but they're actually learning it really uh, they're actually learning that really really well so lots of really interesting um pieces for um for thinking now the next few slides are designed for you so that you can make every child that you work with feel really really special that's the purpose of the next few slides and these are so transformative um that i just cannot wait to see um if you are able to um implement these in in some way and then 
see the impact that the immediate impact that it has on your on the children that you work with the first one is really interesting it it makes this one is designed to make the children feel that they're an expert of learning so when i was a head teacher i always said to all my staff that they were the experts in the every um in in every area in every job that they had they were the experts in that role equally <clears throat> the children are are told and shared with them in the first first week of the academy year which again if we do another session i can um we can focus solely on that which is called the learning to learn week which just devotes that whole week to teaching teaching the children all the things we're going to introduce today so actually devoting a, um, a week in, at the start of the year to make them feel confident um, as learners um, and so in that week they're all told that they are the experts of it um, that they are they are all experts of learning and the way that that's shared with them is it's through this thing which i find really fascinating that if you compare education with architecture i think there's so many similarities and if you if you think about architects they start with a really really detailed plan they know exactly what they want to achieve before they start building the building they know ex the exact measurements they know the materials they, they have to know everything in in amazing detail before they start and then they get expert plumbers electricians bricklayers uh, are, you know they get all the experts that help them make that plan come true yeah that's how a, a building is, is constructed in education it's the same we you have very detailed plans the teacher has very detailed plans you have very detailed plans the school has school development plans and you share this with the children and say we at school have the same we have very detailed plans we know exactly what we want you to learn this year and then who are you say to the children who are then my expert plumbers electricians um and 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 bricklayers and when they when they realize that it's them it's so transformational because it also makes them feel very very special in that they're all different so like plumbers electricians bricklayers you need a whole range of different people and different expertise to make the plans come true so every one of them feels that they are bringing a different type of expertise uh, with them it's just a really really lovely concept and then there's lots of other analogies with uh, with architecture you know the foundations of the building or the foundations of um that you set up like we've talked about the values and the rights and then so the the curriculum can build on those foundations otherwise you know you can share with the children unless we have those foundations the building will collapse so this kind of i just want to inspire with is sharing this this whole language of learning with them and and through these models um it's it's really 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 exciting um but there's nothing i mean we can do lots of things but there's nothing more exciting than this one um and this is if there's nothing else um from today this is the one that will probably have the most 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 impact on the children that you work with and also it's something that you can introduce to your school so you can say to the head uh to your head teacher to your senior leadership team you know this is you know you can try it out with with a group of children that you work with or with your class and then suggest um, at a staff meeting or an inset day that maybe it's something that the whole school could do so it's something i want you i want to equip you with initiatives that you can bring forward to senior leadership um, which is what i used to really uh, appreciate um, from yourselves now this is also they construct this during the first week of the academic year in the learning to learn week and these are called individual models of learning and what happens with this is that they uh, are, are inspired to create a model to describe how they view learning themselves so if you if if you imagine how some children find it so hard to engage in the learning in the first place or find it so hard to um just even contemplate uh, how to go through the process that the learning will take them you know just that that kind of being so overwhelmed at the beginning this is so 
fantastic. This and the next one, the, the actual junk model, are both brilliant. But in this one, what happens is that they create their own model to describe how they view learning. So, for example, if you look at this one, it could be anything at all. So every child will think of something different. If you look at this one, this child is, is um, describing learning as go at, at, like going into a maze. So the child goes, he goes into the maze. He doesn't know where the exit is. Sometimes he gets stuck. He has to start again, come back. But eventually he finds a way out. And that's when he's learned, which is amazing, isn't it? It's, that's what that is fascinating how the, 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 that child views learning. This one is absolutely incredible. This is a year two child in a school in um, Norfolk that I'm working with. And he's fascinated by dinosaurs. So again, anything that's special to the child, to their personal life, they will bring into these, uh, to this model. Um, and he, you'll see later on uh, in the next slide when we, dis when we actually describe the junk model of learning through the pit, um, it all starts here. Uh, when the child is about to learn, you go in the pit, you do the learning, you come out when you've learned. That's basically it. So what he's saying is that before he starts learning, when he's here, he's in prehistoric time, in dinosaur time. Then he goes through learning and he comes out into human time and he's there, prehistoric to human. And I just can't tell you how, you know, these are all uh, drawn, constructed, annotated on the first day of the academic year, usually. They they go on display in the classroom that first day. You just can't imagine how it makes every single child, how they felt before about being more intelligent, less intelligent, is completely annulled. The, every single child feels equally intelligent and equally valued as a learner because they've all been able to describe the unique way of um of learning. This one um, is amazing, isn't it? It's a year five child says, my learning model um, is when you switch the computer on, a bit like the recording button um, uh, matches now, loading, and then it's crossed out OAD and put e -E -A -R -N, learning. Um, so that's, you know, he regards that the loaded, as the computer loads, that's when he's doing the learning and when it's loaded. I understand the learning, but it, the, this can be anything at all. It can be like climbing a ladder one step at a time. It can be like climbing a mountain. Um, you, you, you know, you do it gradually. Sometimes you have to stay in base camp um, for a day and eventually you get to the top. Or it can be, a lot of children say it can be like, um, uh, like a Formula One race where you all start you, you, and then you go at different speeds round. Every now and then you have to come into the pits refresh, change tires, because conditions have changed, come out fresh into the uh, into the race course, into the track again, and then eventually you finish. Uh, it's just absolutely amazing. But if you give them a few examples first, and if you create your own one, um, so in the Paddler that we've created, you can all create your own one, upload it, and then we all have loads of ideas to share. If you create your own one, that you share with the children and then it prompts them to um, share some um, themselves. And I'll just show you with you an am uh, amazing story of how powerful these are. When I was a year five teacher in, um, in Bristol, when I was starting to develop all these things, um, um, a, a child came over and said, my one is a roundabout, Miss Dress. And I said, what do you mean it's a roundabout? She said, Yes, uh, since reception, I think I've just been going round and round and round and never learning anything. So I said, wow, that's amazing that you've been able to describe it. And then all year from then on, we talked about exits of the roundabout. And it just transformed her life because she was able to tell me that she was going off the exits and, and how that was making her learning progress. And the value of these, particularly for yourselves, is that when you then work with your students, you use the language of their model to communicate with them. And that's just incredible because you say to them, okay, whereabouts in the maze are we? Or whereabouts in, in, in time are we, in prehistoric time to modern time? Um, or whereabouts are we with, with the computer loading? So as soon as you talk to them about in, in the language that they've used to describe their learning model, you will have completely different children at your fingertips. It's just really, really amazing and a very wonderful thing to do.
and display and uh, it stays there, um, that, you know, it obviously stays there the whole year as a permanent display and it makes children feel incredibly, incredibly wonderful and valued. So that's a really lovely thing I wanted to share with you. Um, and this is the other one that I was mentioning. Um, and we could do, um, I, I talked a lot about this one when I did the EAL session for uh, Twinkle earlier on. There's, there's a podcast that you, you can access where I talked about um, sort of provision for um, EAL children, but also the, the impact that uh, embracing a, a multicultural, a multilingual thinking approach in the classroom can have on how children feel. Remember, this is all about how children feel before they start learning. This is how we're equipping them emotionally um, and in terms of, of, um, uh, of their self-esteem. Um, and what Nelson Mandela said, if you talk to a person in a language that they understand, it goes to their head. If you talk to them in their language, it goes to their heart. So if we, you know, that kind of emotional literacy, if we can engage children emotionally, um, positively emotionally, then it's just there's, there's nothing more wonderful um, than, than we can do to, to be able to link positive feelings and positive emotions with um, uh, with learning is absolutely fantastic. And then we come to the core um, principle of, um, of what the Joy of Not Knowing approach is, is based on. Um, and again, we can come back and do very specific things just on this um, if, if, you're, if you're really interested to look at it in more detail. But this, I wanted to share with you today because this really does transform children's lives in terms of making them feel that it's brilliant to not know. Um, so the idea is that um, we say to the children that any any time that we're doing anything, it's not just learning at school, but anything we have to do in life, we start here at one. This is where we start with when we have to do anything at all. Um, Adults, children, uh, anyone at any time in life, whatever whatever it is. A lot of the time, this will be their learning objective, but it is this is a model for life and for for being able to to be successful in life. So, um, what happens here is, and um, if if we come back together, I can show you how, um, or when we come back together, I can show you how you can play this out as a little uh, drama exercise with the children in the class, where you, you place children in scenarios. So you bring two children up to the front. First of all, you create this shape in the, uh, on the floor with masking tape um, or with the chairs in the classroom. Just You just create that, um, uh, this, this kind of scenario. And then you bring children um, uh, to the front here to stand at one and you ask uh, a child something that you know they're going to know the answer to. So if they, when they are really happy and they know the answer to it, they you say, oh, brilliant, you knew the answer, you can jump to three. Um, and then you ask the other child um, a, a question that you know they won't know the answer to. Um, and then you ask, the child says, I don't know. Usually, that is something that they don't like to admit or they feel really bad with or they feel embarrassed or they feel anxious or they feel worried or they feel uncomfortable. But in this case, when you do it with them, you say, that is brilliant. It's brilliant that you don't know. And then you just open it up and you say to the children, why might it be really good that they don't know? And they may or may not offer opinions, but uh, some of them may say, well, that's really good because they've got an op they've now got an opportunity to learn um which is what you really want to achieve by the end of this process but um so they find it really funny as well because saying to them um that it's brilliant that they don't know is is hilarious but it is, has a really sort of deep connotation behind it and it's once you say that to a child their their lives totally change it's something that you know to, to to celebrate the fact that they don't know is brilliant and the fact that we can celebrate the um the the, the um 
the fact that they that we're saying is really good not to know is because you'll see by the end they they realize that in order to learn something new you have to not know it first so it's a position we have to be in if we're going to learn anything new anyway so when they say they don't know you say okay that's brilliant they don't know and you say let's go into the pit so when they go into two and they actually walk in um they go in here and then here you say to them well you know what can you do to start to work out the answer um who can you ask what resources can you use what knowledge do you already have you know this is what questions can you ask you know what this is where they build all their strategies for being able to learn and be an effective learner and eventually you help them through this process using lots of different strategies and they get the answer and when they get to the answer they can climb out again and this is the key moment that will change the lives of all the children you work with you say to them okay child a and b started here and they both finish here so they start in the same place both finish in the same place but when child a that felt really happy that they knew the answer and jumped across did they learn anything the child will say or the children will say in the class no because they already knew it and then you say the child that felt really worried embarrassed didn't anxious that they didn't know went through this process and is here now have they learned something and they said yes um so then they see that in order in order to learn something new you have to not know it first so it becomes a place of real comfort and a place of of um seeking because they they want to seek being in a position of not knowing because they know that's the only they start to realize that that's the only a time when they're going to learn something new and what's really interesting is that emotionally for all of us we want to keep jumping across don't we if i asked you a question now you would feel much more comfortable if you knew the answer but the, again going back to the purpose of learning if you share this with the children you say if every question i asked you if everything i used to do you actually know the answer to or you know how to do it is there any purpose in what we're doing um so it's it starts to make them feel really comfortable with being in a position where they're challenged where they're slightly outside their comfort zone because they they re they become really conscious that in order to learn they you, they have to um be in a position of of not knowing it obviously it, this is a very you know it's a quite a complex thing to share with the children because when we say they're in a position of not knowing they're in a position of not knowing this particular aspect but they also know that they know a huge amount that's going to help them learn their next step so it's not about ignorance it's not about um anything any deficiency it's just that they are about to embark on their next step of learning and it's just a wonderful way to share it with them and even more for yourselves this is really exciting even more you say to the children that when they go into the learn when they launch into the learn and they can launch in any way they like so it takes away all the pressure of having to launch straight away into being able to do it really well so some children may want and this a lot of it is um with yourselves where they want to spend a little bit more time discussing it uh, you know like this is the swimming pool so this be like the little uh learner pool you know by the main pool where children's um the toddler pool the, uh, next to it um they may spend a little bit more time there that's great before they go in some of them may want to go in really cautiously down the down the steps some of them may want to jump in if they're confident and some of them who are already very very confident with being able to be playful with your concepts that you're introducing may want to the diving board and 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 dive into the deep end so this is really nice to share with them because it it says to them even you know it's brilliant not to know and even when i don't know i have so many choices of how to access the learning and for each child is going to be um they're going to take a different amount of time and they're going to choose uh the different ways of of actually um moving in and from your 
uh, position to practical ideas for yourself as well is to then share with the children very openly and have something like this where every time you've helped them to learn something or they've been successful at learning, they say to you, if this with a post-it note, if this is up on the wall, go on put on the with a post-it note, what has helped you, who has helped you, what conditions, which person, what strategies have helped you whilst you were here to learn. And this is collects and collects over the year. Um, and it all the time makes them feel really, really successful. And then um, hopefully we will then be able to go through because actually the whole process is is really interestingly divided into six steps um, and each one has its own kind of really really interesting um, um, kind of uh, texture to it um, but mainly the, the, the main thing that I want to ex sort of share with you today is that when they're here if you can get the children to know what they know that they know and what they know that they don't know um, is amazing just using that language what do you know that you know what do you know that you don't know about what we're about to do learn and this is the intrinsic motivation this is what we we're talking at the beginning if all the conditions are in place then the children will go will want to go from one to two and i imagine that a lot of the children that you work with are finding this stage really really tricky to going from this is what we're doing to oh good i want to learn it yeah, um, I'm guessing that this is a critical stage. So that intrinsic motivation to want to engage is fantastic. This is a swimming pool bit. How do you go in? And then giving them all the strategies. So here they say to themselves, I want to know what I know I don't know. Yeah, I want to know. And the reason why they want to know what they know they don't know is because in three, you, particularly yourselves, are offering them everything they need to be able to know how to know what they want to know that they know they don't know. It's so fascinating, but we'll come back and do this uh, in great detail. So you can actually then describe when you with your, when you're working with the children, you can then use steps one to six as a real basis for, um, for all the learning. Um, this is cycling, thinking how the learning is going. This is, going from knowledge to understanding. So once they've got the answer, you say to the children, that's well, knowing the answer is not enough. What does the answer mean? So moving from knowledge to understanding, then there's so many ways in which uh, that can be done um, with your children. So giving them challenges, uh, use and information in a different context, all sorts of things that are really, really interesting. But the concept of the answer not being the end is really fascinating for them as well. Um, that they just not um, there to acquire knowledge. So that is the kind of um, run through of all the ideas that um, are kind of the, the main principles that underpin the approach and that make children feel amazingly well about themselves as individuals and as learners. So then they can um, feel able to access uh, the curriculum enthusiastically and intrinsically. And I want to share with you some actual um, ideas and activities that are really easy to introduce um, and that make a huge difference to the way that children feel about learning. And most importantly, about yourselves, working with yourselves, uh, learning with yourselves, and also about coming to school. You know, this, this makes such a difference to their enthusiasm for running into school. Um, let me start with reception. These are books which I've um, launched with children in reception um, and the nursery when I was head of uh, an infant nursery school called the Y books. And this is where they come in every morning and write a philosophical question. You know, children have thousands of philosophical questions in their minds and there's nothing more wonderful to, to say to them first thing in the morning when they come in. They, they write their names or they pick their, their register or the lunch choices. And then they go and get their white books and write some of the most amazing, um, why is the sky blue? You know, all their philosophical questions. And then these are used to have philosophical discussions with them, which again, in future sessions, we can do one just on philosophy with children and the, the, the amazing power of that. 
Then all the children, so this is key stage one and key stage two, um, uh, have um, an, uh, a different aspect of this called the thinking skill starters. And these are open-ended challenges that welcome the children every day in the morning. And they have their own books. When we stop, I'll show, I've got loads of their books here. Um, when I can share, um, we'll stop sharing the screen. Um, so they all have their books and every morning they have a challenge that they absolutely love engaging with. But with yourself, it doesn't have to be a challenge that's done to the whole class in the morning necessarily. It can be as you start to work with them, as you start to, you know, you may even be taking a, a whole class. Um, you start the learning or the thinking about the learning that's to come with an open ending challenge that challenges them. This is when they think, this is an example of them thinking about the learning without realizing that they're thinking about the learning. These are incredible. And I've got um, in the Padlet, I've put in an article um, about introducing these. But most importantly, that article are the quotes of how the children feel about them. It's just the most amazing start to the day, which is really, really, really transformational. And then this is, um, this is an example of some of them, you know, it could be anything at all. What's the circle? So they all have give out hundreds of ideas um, or what makes you happy or makes you love. You know, it could just, it could just be anything at all. If you're doing verbs, uh, illustrating the verb with the first letter, um, word associations, odd one hours. Yeah, there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. Um, and the book has got a whole chapter on there. And there's, I've also got um, another book called Start Thinking, which is um, a whole, it's just devoted to these, a whole selection of these. Um, imagine if you're, you're with the older children, if you're doing uh, anything to do with the body uh, in science, you start with what well, the different similarities between blood and ketchup. And I just absolutely love it. But when they're thinking about this, they're really thinking deeply about the concepts that you're trying to teach. So, yeah, all those amazing things. Then these. I imagine that you do a lot of work with your uh, students to do um, with literacy, with PSHE, with um, uh, helping them to uh, unpick stories, all that sort of thing. And these are amazing. I wanted to give you these as ideas to use. So, so simple, but so amazing. These are called fortune lines. So if you're reading a story to the children, you can draw yourself. Again, I've got loads to show you here in a second when we come off the the present the PowerPoint. Um, so you just draw a little graph um, and the children, as you read the story, as you analyze the story, as you think about the story, the children are, are drawing as a line the fortune of the character. So good fortune, less good, really not good. So, um, so uh, it depends what's happening with the character from good to really bad. Um, so you can see in red here, this character started with good fortune, ended uh, really badly. This one started badly, ended really well. And every time they change the angle of the line, they describe either write themselves or you describe for them what is happening in the story to make that line change direction. These are amazing and the children absolutely love them. Concept lines are even more amazing. Um, because these allow you to allow the children to think freely without worrying that there's a right or wrong answer. Um, and what you need with a concept line is just opposites at either end. That's all you need. And then the child, so this is a character in a story, then the child places the character where they think it should be. So you think it might be there, the child might think there. As long as you justify your thinking, um, there's no, there's no right or wrong answer. So these are brilliant. Um, it could be how the children are feeling. It could, you could use uh, concept lines in maths, zero to one, fractions, decimals, percentage. It could be anything at all. Um, I used to use them every single day. And um, if you use them also um, uh, with, um, uh, with a jumping rope, a skipping rope at the front, children can hold a skipping rope and then can actually line up themselves on, on the lines, which are really, really fantastic. So it's a very active way of uh, getting them to, to use them. And these maybe, um, I don't know if you know about this, traffic lights are so wonderful. 
Um, they can be, um, this is for children to respond to your questioning uh, in uh, as a whole group um, without putting hands up. So they're responding to you by showing you the, 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 the right color of card. So for example, if you make red two, yellow three and green four, and you say, what's well, one at one, they will show you the red card. Um, and it's just so fantastic, but you can also use them um, as I'm sure you know, lots of schools use them for, um, you know, how you're feeling, kind of emotional regulation. Um, but you can also use them for saying, um, my, you know, my learning's going really well, or I need help from a peer, yellow, or I need help from an adult, red. So you can use them in so many different ways, but these are three great, great, great uh, techniques that are really lovely to uh, employ as part of everything that you do. And then this is so wonderful. I don't know if um, you've come across mind mapping, but teaching children to mind map, um, uh, giving them the instructions and then getting them to produce the first one about themselves, first of all, gives you a huge amount of um, information about them, their lives, their hobbies, what they like, their, you know, ev everything about themselves. But they also, they feel that you know exactly um, a lot about them as people, not just as, as, um, as, as children in the classroom, but, you know, about their whole lives, their whole families, everything. Um, but the important thing is that they then use the skill of mind mapping to structure their thinking in whatever you're doing. So this could then be Victorians or could be anything at all in the center. And then they they produce a mind map of their thinking and structuring their thinking um, uh, um, at, at all times. It's a way of, you know, if they, even if they're going to write a story, they, they put the, the story title in the middle and then they do characters in, uh, in uh, introduction um, event, uh, you know, the resolution, you know, they can it, it could be. My mapping is just so, so wonderful um, in terms of enabling to structure their thinking. And this is a mind map of the bonus hats. Again, it'd be really good to do a follow up session on how to use these hats with your children, because if you have a group and you give each child a hat and you're thinking about one aspect of the learning, they're all responding to that aspect using a different way of thinking and a different way of feeling. It's so, uh, these are amazing. I'm, sh I'm sure some of you may have come across some De Bono's uh, thinking hats, but again, imagine the children coming to you as a group. They know they're going to be doing all these amazing things. And when they're doing this, again, they're learning without really realizing that they're learning because they're reacting to things and seeing things from different perspectives, um, which they they would never have imagined to be um, thinking about that thing from that perspective that they have been placed um, along these um, these different hats. Um, so the, this, the red is, is, is responding to something in it from an emotional point of view. Um, the, the yellow one is always positive, the green one always has good ideas and so on. Um, so I've used them a lot for uh, writing out science investigations or, or putting themselves in um, in, in the position of a character and a text and all sorts of things. So brilliant, really, really brilliant. And then this, again, you can introduce uh, to your school, to your, to your classroom, to your children, the idea of the thinking page. And for you, this is so fantastic because if you say to them, the left-hand side, when you come to work with me, the left-hand side of your book is your thinking page. Then they can write there anything they like. They can try as many things they can have a girl's main spellings they can trial and error they can experiment they can but this won't this is never marked or judged in any way so we've thrown them up to learn in a in, in a really really fantastic way and also uh rather than using whiteboards where everything all the evidence is wiped out the thinking page is permanent because every left hand page of the book becomes a thinking page where there's a permanent record of their thinking throughout the year um, so this is a kind of permanent whiteboard if you if you like um, i know there are uses for whiteboards but i always it's always broke my heart when um when it's all rubbed out um, so then i developed the 
um, the idea of the thinking page. And children absolutely love it. Say, so can I do this on my thinking page? And they, you know, anything that frees them up from worry um, is fantastic. And then again, we can go into a lot more detail with this, but it's, it's when you um, are with your uh, children, when you're working with them, you can reinterpret the learning objective to make it a really interesting question. So if the learning objective in the classroom is to study um, the properties of 2D shape, when they come to you, when you work with them, you might launch the lesson by discussing with them whether 2D shapes exist. So this is what I call the philosophical learning objective, uh, which is so amazing because it starts that discussion and enthusiasm for wanting to learn um, so wonderfully. And then some other ideas is our images. Uh, it's called image of the week. So you present them with a work of art, uh, anything at all as a stimulus. And then they have um, uh, all week to uh, think through uh, through the, the work of art. And this one was displayed um, in the corridor of the school. So anybody walking along the corridor could respond to it. So you can adapt that in any way that you wish. The other one that I wanted to share with you is this one. So when they come to you, um, and a way of getting them to think uh, about a topic or a subject that you're working them with is to get to play Scrabble with them. So what you need is some squared bit of paper, and all you need to do is follow, play in a difference. So you, the, the child plays in one color, you play in another color. And if you have more than one uh, child in the group, they play in a different color as well. Um, and it's just they just think about words associated with the topic that you're learning, you're discussing. They're just thinking of words. Um, but you, but in writing those words, you have to follow the Scrabble convention so they can't be next to each other. That's all. And it's so amazing. They absolutely love it. They can carry this on at home with their families. You can then um, give them the real, the real value of the letters in Scrabble and make into a mathematical investigation as is shown here. This child has worked out which who is one by using all those words. It's just brilliant and they absolutely love it. And again, gives you another um, little, little toolkit. Um, and then this one um, is a recipe for a lifelong learner. So you can actually get the children to construct a recipe to say um, of what makes them learn really effectively uh, but as a, as a recipe, so they will say to you, um, oh, um, you know, 50 grams of resilience or 100 grams of uh, love and guidance, all sorts of things. And then just wanted to show that this uh, year six child um, in Ipswich then went home and actually cooked his um, recipe uh, of a lifelong learner, which I, you know, I just can't imagine anything more wonderful to get to a child uh, through school and through strategies to do with learning to then uh, for them to then um, be manifested in that way at home um, and this is how we started um, so I wanted to give you the the thought that these are really useful and again we can do a session on how to use this throughout the year but um, these are the lifelong learning dispositions and then what I've also created um, which are really useful um, are the opposite. So then the children can map themselves at the start of the end, at the end of the year in where they think they are going um, in terms of, obviously they want to move towards this side uh, all the time. So they start there and move there. Um, and it's really interesting to share these things with them because this is what blocks them from learning. Um, and this is um, where they want to be. Um, so yeah, these are, really lovely ones for you to um, inspire the children with as well. And then these are ones that, um, again, are where they map themselves, but this is where they map themselves in terms of how they feel about learning. So what we were saying at the beginning is that if we feel like this, we feel really well, we feel really good emotionally. If we are on this side, we're not feeling comfortable emotionally. Um, but then we share with the children that if we're feeling like this, we're not learning anything new. If we're feeling like this, we're in the process of learning. So the idea of this is to start to make the children that you work with feel comfortable with being uncomfortable. Yeah, then, and that's the kind of key to learning. But yeah, we can do lots, lots more along those uh, lines as these. These are the sort of ideas of the learning objective as a 
philosophical question for you. And then I just wanted to finish with two really amazing things that bring everything together. This is a child um, in Spain whose uh, teachers adopted the, the junk philosophy. And he sent me this and he's, he's drawn himself inside the pit while he's learning with a friend and so not on his own, both smiling, both saying, no lo sé, I don't know, and then called it the pit of happiness. And I just think if you can achieve that with um, with a child to, to associate not knowing with happiness is is just amazing. And then this as well, a child in year five saying that before they they were exposed to all this, they thought that learning was all about intelligence, but now they know it's about love for learning, creativity, happiness, and effort. So again, the emotional part, realizing that they have to feel a little bit uncomfortable. Um, but yeah, these are just wonderful, wonderful quotes that I wanted to um, share with yourselves as we finish. And then if I stop um, sharing the screen now, we come back together. Mm -hmm.